pastor in uh, Jackson, Michigan. And uh, hey, come on in. And uh, I want to talk about biblical mythology and biblical monsters, which is a topic that I absolutely love. So if I geek out or if at some point, you know, you think this guy has jumped off the reservation or sold the farm or whatever, just raise your hand or interrupt me in your so what I want to do is take about 30 or 40 minutes and take you through a real overview of the material in the scriptures surrounding all these cryptozoological themes, all these false gods, all this weird and wild and wonderful stuff that most people either misinterpret or ignore completely because it's so weird. And I want to talk to you about the spiritual meaning of some of this stuff and how we can actually get real words out of it. And the reason that I've chosen this topic for you is because I think it fits so well with video games. Not only because video games have monsters and video games have cool stuff, but I'm a big video game dork, so I love all that. Here, all my heroes. I actually begged to come and speak at this conference when I heard there was a Christian video game developer conference. I, oh man, I felt like I got my braces back. It was awesome. It was cool to come <laughs> So, I, I, not only do I think that there's kind of a rhyme there, but I think that video games, and this material in the scriptures actually taps into something a little deeper, a little more primal than just the nouns of, you know, the behemoth or leviathan or whatever, but it goes into our, our secret fears. Those things that we keep with us at night, those things that we keep with us in the back of our minds, and the way in which we engage those, the way in which we tease those out, and the way in which we let those have free reign throughout our imagination, largely define who we are, not only as individuals, but also as the so let me pray for us, and then uh, we'll go ahead and get started. But Jesus, we love you, and we thank you for the good gift of yourself and of your word. And we want to see the scriptures with new lenses today. We want to be entered and immersed into your story. And as a result, we want to become more brave, more bold, more strong, more courageous, and more adventurous. Not only in our relationship with you, but in everything. We love you, and we give you all. Amen. Amen. All right, so if you have any questions, you can holler them out. You can interrupt me. If I see you looking bored, I will likely mock you, and then we're going to have to ask our friends here to just edit that out of the table. That's, that's what we're going for. Okay. In the Bible, you see all this stuff, right? You see stories about Baal, about Marduk, about Asherah poles. In fact, in the King James Version of the Bible, in the 1611 translation, the first King James Version of the Bible, you see all this weird stuff about unicorns, about merfolk, mermen, and I get into that in the, in the book, Monsters, that is kind of a fleshed out, you know, fuller version of this seminar, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But the big question that most people have when they read all that stuff is, is it real? Like, were there really unicorns, and did we somehow miss out on finding them? But can the Bible substantiate unicorns? Did Jesus write a dinosaur to work like Fred Flintstone? And I think the whole question of whether or not these things mean what they, what we might think they mean in our contemporary context actually really misses the point of why they're in there and what they're supposed to do. So, I, now I'm a biblicist, okay, so I'm not about to tell you that the Bible is full of myths, not by a long shot, not the way that we think that word means at all, but I do want you to think less about whether or not the dinosaurs were contemporaries of Job. I want you to set that conclusion aside for just a moment and think about this phrase. That with monsters, both in the scriptures and in mythology and in our real life, whether or not the monsters are real is less important than whether or not we're really afraid. And I want you to think about the fact that in the Bible, the people in this pre-industrialized agrarian society were scared of all kinds of crap for which we have no evidence whatsoever. Basilisks, cockatrice, like, we have no evidence that these things ever walked the earth in the way that we typically think about them in our Rob Zombie, Rob Zombie horror movies or whatnot. But the people then were absolutely terrified. And I want us to concentrate on their fear and on the way they responded to their fear and on the way they invited God to speak to them in the midst of their fear. Because that's where I think the real biblical word of this material is. All right, are you bored already? Okay, that's awesome. Because I'm about to get animated. It's, it's going to get hot. It's going to just illuminate awesomeness. All right. Uh, when I was a little kid, maybe sixth or seventh grade, me and my buddies used to sneak out of our house at night. Don't do that, Jared. It's bad. Your dad will beat you. And we used to sneak out. Our dads wouldn't beat us. 
happened. We would sneak out, we would go to this place, Tinehead Park, it's about a five minute walk from our house, and Tinehead Park was surrounded by all these tall evergreen trees. So no matter what time of the year you were in Tinehead, it was pitch black after about seven or eight o'clock at night. And we could go deep into the heart of Tinehead Park into Tinehead Forest, and you would be completely cut off from every light whatsoever. We refused to bring flashlights because the sensation that we got when we went into Tinehead Park was one of total immersion. And we were immersed in our imagination and in our fear. And we kind of dubbed this little spot where you could hear the creek running through the ground and you could hear kind of the wind blowing through the leaves and periodically you could hear little birds or whatever. We dubbed this little spot the bad place because we'd get out there in our little, you know, 10, 12 year old minds and we'd just listen and it would scare the heebie-jeebies right out of us because we imagined all the things that were lurking under every bush and behind every little shrub. And we imagined that in the bad place lived the bad thing. I don't know what the bad thing was going to do other than make me pee my pants, but I did that very successfully many times during middle school. But I think that this little example of a place where we went, where our imaginations went crazy, is a good way for us to begin our conversation about the imagination of faith and of fear. Because we all have monsters that run around in our lives. Of course, as we get older, our monsters are different. We're no longer worried about a dark spot in the woods, or we're no longer worried about something lurking behind every bush. We're worried about different monsters like unemployment, a declining economy. We heard about a monster this morning about the declining effectiveness of America and or Christianity and, and 21st century postmodern America. I mean, there's lots of monsters. There's lots of things out there that scare us. And I think the Bible has real worth, real instruction for us about how to deal with that. Here. So let me start by reading that really common scripture. Can you guess which one I'm going to read? Close. That was actually my second choice. Jump 317, that was my third choice. <laughs> no, Isaiah, right? Let's see. Isaiah, chapter 43. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be, fur be burned up, and the flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. I am your Savior. We have monsters, monsters that we see in the scriptures, monsters that we experience in real life, monsters of our imagination. And our monsters genuinely terrify us. And it's in the midst of our genuine terror that God, as our rescuer, as our savior, and as our Messiah, becomes tangible, becomes real, and becomes someone we will never, ever, ever let go of. For most of our lives, we shun the things that scare us, and maybe rightly so. But when we're scared, when we're at our wit's end, when we're out of resources, that's when Christ actually saves us in a way, in a way that we can actually feel and perceive and understand. And there's both the good biblical words of this material. So there are four categories of monsters in the Bible. I want to talk about each one in turn briefly. Firstly, there are false gods. Secondly, Cryptozoological creatures, creatures of myth and legend. Thirdly, apocalyptic monsters. And into that category of apocalyptic monsters, you know, end times, beasts and ghouls, we might also put God, or rather, an erroneous conception of God. And then lastly, idols. So these are the four kinds of monsters in the Bible as we have them. First, let's talk about these false gods. Can you think of any of the names of false gods in the first testament? Baal. Baal. Marduk. Marduk. Molech. Molech. Beelzebub. Beelzebub. Asherah. Asherah, yeah. Anybody else? Dagon. Dagon. I just love my atheist. Yeah. Good score. Yeah. That's right. First Samuel breakfast at Bill. Yeah. Excellent. Now, one of the things that I find fascinating is that the Old Testament never discounts the reality of false gods. Never do you see scriptural evidence where God says they're not actually there and they're not actually real. In fact, in many parts of the Hebrew Bible and rabbinical commentaries, they describe Yahweh as being the God above gods. It's not that he's the only God. It's that he is the butt-kicking God. He is the God at the top of the totem pole. He is the God to whom all other gods 
owe their allegiance. And so that brings some of our understanding of the First Testament. Because when we read about all these guys, we typically think, oh yeah, you know, Baal, he was just like a, I don't know, like a skateboard company bumper sticker. You know, he didn't really mean anything. He was just a badge that somebody wore. But that's not how they thought about it then. In order for us to correctly understand the scriptures, we've got to put ourselves in their world and understand those scriptures as they were happening to those people. And when those people talked about Baal or Astra or Marduk or Dagon or whoever, they were genuinely terrified that these guys would work weird juju on them, that these guys had power, that these guys exerted influence. And so because of their fear, they often took their eyes off of Yahweh, off of the God above gods, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, creator of heaven and earth, and put him on Dagon, or put him on Ashtra, or put him on Marduk. They took their focus off of the true God and put them their eyes onto the false one. Now, we don't have false gods like this today, but usually when people start talking about our false gods today, what kind of things are they talking about? Money. Money. Yes. TV. Garrett earmuffs. Tablet sex. Okay, you can earmuffs now. Okay. They talk about all the kinds of things that people worship and people serve. But I think there's another kind of false god. See, if we understand those false gods in the First Testament, not simply as supernatural authority, or not simply as supernatural personages, but if we understand them as false kinds of authority, we recognize that that same false godhood, that same false deity, that same false authority exists today. And it exists in a multiplicity of forms. For example, any time that you feel you've got to please somebody, you find yourself in a position of worshiping a false god. Every time you feel like you've got to make somebody proud, every time you feel like you've got to capitulate, every time you feel like you've got to compromise, you find yourself enslaved into a false kind of authority. So my buddy Nathaniel, that's not his real name, I'm going to make up all kinds of names. We're not going to call that lying right now, we're going to call that changing the story to protect the idiots. All right, so my big friend, <laughs> he uh, was maybe three or four years old when his dad skipped town and left he and his mom grown up. So Nathaniel grows up without a father figure really common story in the world today. Now, as Nathaniel becomes older and he explores his relationship with Jesus, he's got a pretty big dad-sized hole in his life. Like many other young men without a strong father figure, Nathaniel has developed a kind of ache for strong authority. Now, there's a certain kind of thing that dads tend to do in most homes. Not you, you're perfect, everybody but Evan, though, is oftentimes overbearing, oftentimes really direct, oftentimes a little <laughs> disciplinarian. In fact, if there's shame involved in a home, it's usually a father shaming a son for not living up to his male possessions. Well, it's just kidding, but you don't have to be okay with her anyway, right? It's usually a father <laughs> doing those kind of things to his children. Well, in the absence of a strong male father figure, Nathaniel comes to have this yearning to hear even the bad kinds of paternal influence even the bad kinds of paternal interaction. And so Nathaniel comes to appreciate uh, preachers who shame their congregations. He comes to look for really strong and really critical voices that will tell him all the things he's doing wrong in the starkest possible ways because it feels to him like he's finally got the kind of dad. And he'll capitulate, he'll compromise, he'll kind of weaken under these influences because he wants because he wants to be found worthy. He wants some outside source of approval, somebody who matters, somebody who can say, you're growing up to be a real man, the way men are supposed to be. And the same kind of power to which Nathaniel is succumbing is the same kind of power that the ancient Israelites succumbed when they would worship Marduk or Baal. Now, of course, one of the main themes of the First Testament is that he throughout the whole scripture is what is it? God will not suffer any competition, right? Yahweh is going, look, you can't serve me and Dagon. That's why in 1 Samuel there's a whole cool story about the Ark of the Covenant being brought into Dagon's high temple. You know this story, right? The Ark of the Covenant gets brought in, and Dagon, who by all accounts looks kind of like a merman, the statue of Dagon cracks in two and falls face down in front of the Ark as if Dagon himself must be worshiping and bowed low and prostrate before Yahweh. God will not suffer. <laughs> right. And so for us, 
whether we think about real life, whether we think about video games, or whether we think about narratives, we've got to understand that the word is one of the driving forces of our spirituality and our humanity. And when people fall under the power of false gods or false authority, what they're really looking for is worth. Now, worth is a big thing in video games, right? I mean, all the Zelda games are based on worth. You achieve, you grow up out of your little, you know, acorn town, like a Keebler elf with a sword and some nunchucks. <laughs> and you go out in the world to prove your worth. Prince of Persia is always about that, right? Some philandering prince goes out and tries to prove that he's not a big idiot, you know, and win the heart of the girl who thinks he's like, you know, a poop stain or whatever, right? And he's proving his value, he's proving his valor. Word, when it's ascribed appropriately to God, can be given on loan appropriately to the end. And that's a major meaning in the biblical context. All right, can I move on? Do you want to hear more about the false gods? No. You regret coming early because I moved you in this place and I'm like, you seem very nice and we both grow up again. All right, second <laughs> The second kind, arguably the most fun kind, no, don't throw it serious at me. Very <laughs> tender hearted. You know. The second kind of monster in the scripture are like the most fun ones, right? The cryptozoological means. Now you know what that word means, right? Cryptid or something that's cryptozoological means. It's like a made-up monster. Okay? Now maybe they're not made up. I mean, maybe there really were basilisks or whatever, right? But there's a lot of stuff in the Bible. Let me give you kind of a summary of what shows up and where. There's Leviathan, of course, that we see all over in Job. But did you know, actually, this is cool. Leviathan's my favorite. He's everybody's favorite, really. But did you know that Leviathan appears in Genesis 1? That the word for Leviathan repeatedly throughout the First Testament is the Hebrew word tanin, which means the great serpent of the deep. And did you know that Leviathan, far from being an adversary of God, is actually one of God's good and well-ordered created beings? That there's even a salvation history for Leviathan. In fact, many Hebrew scholars, and I'm just getting amped up here, that's one of the first of like 17 examples I give. <laughs> many Hebrew scholars actually think that the great fish in Jonah was Leviathan. And that there's this whole story arc for Leviathan. He's created by God to be good, either as one being or as a whole race of beings, and then experiences his own kind of fall. Because repeatedly throughout the Psalms, we're seeing that God battles Leviathan, that God must subdue the great chaos serpent, oftentimes compared to all these other ancient Mesopotamian and ancient Near Eastern things. And sorry, I'm geeking out a little bit here, but this is like, this is like Kung Fu, man. This is awesome. <laughs> okay, and then you see this whole story arc in Jonah, right, in which in which this great serpent of the sea, in which this, this being can be used as an instrument of God's purposes. And then, of course, you see all this stuff in Job, where God's speaking about Leviathan almost like it's his favorite pet. You know, can you pull in Leviathan as a fish hook? Look, consider his scales. Look, look at his majesty and his beauty. In fact, there's a one Derek Levinson. He's an Old Testament scholar, a Christian guy, but an Old Testament scholar. He talks about the fact that Leviathan and Behemoth are like the billboards for the majesty of God's creation. And that when people look at Leviathan and all its majesty and all its beauty and all its grandeur, that they're supposed to think, holy crap, God made that. That's how awesome he is. And then there's a little bit of debate about what happens in the Second Testament with Leviathan. You know, is Leviathan the good guy or the bad guy in Revelation? How does all that spin out? But, but the point remains is that there's more to the story of Leviathan than trying to just figure out whether or not it was a dinosaur. Is it Brontosaurus? Is it a saber tooth? All that stuff that seems sort of like the more popular rendering of why that stuff is in there is really, it's really misplaced. You gotta just look and read the scriptures and the stories that they tell and recognize that there's something fantastic going on. So anyway, Leviathan, they have it, Isaiah chapter 14, only in the King James Version of 1611, by the way, the earliest, talks about a basilisk. Does anybody know what that is? What a basilisk is? Is it kind of some sort of snake-like thing or? It's like a rooster lion viper. Do you know what it is? It's got like two legs. It has a third, right? It's got two legs, but it's a snake. Yeah. And there's a, there's a, there's a mane involved in it somewhere. Yeah. But anyway, it's a, it's a composite creature. So there's a basilisk, but you got to look hard to find that in there. Um, there's a unicorn that's listed in Numbers uh, chapter 23, verse 22. Although in our modern English translations, because we know there have never been unicorns, it's no longer called a unicorn. In fact, sometimes in our modern English translations, it's called a goat. Sometimes in our modern English translations, it's referred to as a rhinoceros, which might actually be a conceivable interpretation because the Hebrew word is ram, which means single horn. But in the earliest translations of our English Bible, it was known as a unicorn, the 
it's just why when you hear people, that, that's a really popular one that people talk about unicorns in the Bible, and they use that as proof that the Bible is like full of baloney. Well, no, 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 they're, they're talking about this right now, which again, likely is a rhinoceros. Uh, Leviticus 11.10 talks about the nefesh hashaya, the souls of those who live under the sea. And taken together with other Eastern, uh, ancient Near Eastern mythological references, they think that might have been talking about mermen or merwomen or merfolk. There are giants, of course, in the scripture. Who are the famous giants? Goliath. Uh, the Nephilim are different, but yeah, there's Goliath. There's the uh, the sons of Anak, right? The Anakim. There's also the Rephaim. Uh, there's dwarves listed in the Bible. Did you know that? Where have they been hiding, Gimli? <laughs> <laughs> Um, in Ezekiel chapter 27, in the Hebrew, we read about gamadine. Now, gamadine is a Hebrew word that means up to thigh height. And so if you do a little digging, you find out that there were these race of people that everybody sort of unilaterally agreed were out there somewhere that were about yay high, that were fantastic archers, which is just funny. <laughs> there's all these spectacular dwarf archers. I'm guessing they were using crossbows or short bows or whatever. But um, anybody know the story about the werewolf in the scripture? Oh yeah, close. Uh, that, uh, close because it's about Daniel. There's a story. There's a story in Daniel chapter. Let me see what's the reference here. In Daniel chapter four, that talks about Nebuchadnezzar being transformed into a wild beast and roaming all throughout the land. Right. So that's the first sort of ancient Near Eastern example we have of lycanthropy. There's a phoenix listed in several of the Hebrew translations and also in the English translations. It's a, the Hebrew word is chol, and it shows up in Job chapter 29. There are griffins, which are again composite beings all throughout Ezekiel, all throughout Isaiah, all throughout Revelation, and who are the griffins, right? Those are the things that have a head like a, and feet like a, and a body like a, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. Is that, I'm having fun right now? Yeah. You're not having fun? Then forget you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then of course, uh, dragons. You know what the most often cited dragon is in the Bible? It's a seraphim. The word seraphim literally means seraph, which angel, right? The worshiping angel, right? The word seraph literally means fiery flying serpent. So every time you read about these angelic messengers, you can't think about a naked baby, right? <laughs> you gotta think the reason, like, you notice that in the Bible, every time an angel shows up, what does everybody do? They poop their pants, right? They run away. Oh my God, I can't even look at them. They're too terrible. They, they wanna worship the angels. Well, it's not because they're running around with a diaper and a harp. Right? So when these things show up, I mean, the literal translation of seraph is fiery, flying serpent. So when you read, like, in Isaiah, these things show up, and what are they? They're made out of fire, they're covered with eyes, they have six wings. That is scary, right? And these are the ways in which God chooses to reveal himself to his people. Now, again, what did I tell you at the very beginning? Did I introduce you to all this biblical mythology? And if you're like me and you kind of like to think things through, you're going, wait a minute, I'm not sure that I believed in all of that, right? You have to understand that when we read these ancient Near Eastern accounts, we're reading literature, and it's inspired literature, right? But we're reading literature from a free industrialized ancient Near Eastern mind. And when they see this stuff, they're coming up with the best possible ways they have to describe what they see. And whether or not what they see is how we would describe it now, less important than whether or not these people were actually afraid of it. And they were. They were always terrified of the many splendors and wonders of God. That's why God is awesome. That's why his wrath is terrible. That's why he is great. It's because he controls the dwarf archers. <laughs> There's a German word, actually, a theological term that's become very popularized in sort of the uh, literati circles of Hollywood. It's a German word called Unheimlich. Does anybody know what that means? It removes something from your throat. Yeah, Unheimlich, the Unheimlich maneuver. Yeah, I don't speak any German, so I only learn it from theology, right? But there's the Unheimlich means the sensation of not feeling safe while you're at home. Anybody see Scream? Good time not to fess up. Seriously, way to go. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? How about vampire movies? What's the one thing vampires can't do? Can't go in your house. They can't come to your house so that you can feel safe when you're at home. Anybody see Fright Night when you were a little kid? 
right? What was the big boo-boo about Fright Night? He knows there's a vampire living next door, and his mom starts flirting with the vampire. No, no, mom, qu'est-ce que c'est, right? And what does she do? She invites the vampire into his house. And so the main character in Fright Night, right, he gets terrified because now he knows he's no longer safe at home. Monsters, these cryptids in the First Testament, these beasts throughout all the Bible are personifications of the human family. Like they're the things that make you feel not safe at home. Now we wrestle with the same kind of fear, right? We have all kinds of things that make us feel not safe at home. Should I the steps? <laughs> Right? We have all kinds of things that make us feel not safe at home. Anybody find the, um, there was an iPhone app that was like a pedophile detector? Did you hear about this? <laughs> the sex offender locator is the, the, the thing the app was called. It was released maybe about a year ago. And I remember there was a group of people in our neighborhood, they all got it, and they found out that there was about a mile, maybe, maybe three quarters of a mile from my house, there was a sex offender halfway house. And they picketed outside the sex offender halfway house because of this app that they got to their phone. Because they began to be completely consumed by their fear that all these sex offenders would come breaking into their windows and harming their children in the middle of the night. Now, not a completely unjustified tension. We understand there's a reason why, you know, they have to be made a public record and, you know, they go for rehabilitation to do and all that. But the feeling that the people in my neighborhood had was that they were no longer safe at home. One of the most powerful and primal emotions is that you can't be safe, even in the place where you're safe. Well, the first kind of monster we talked about was the monster of false God. And we talked about the fact that the antidote to that <clears throat> false God, that false authority, is a sense that you're worthy, that God makes you worthy because you call his, because he adopts you into his family, because he gives you worth, because you get your worth from him. Well, in the second kind of monster, we're really talking about these cryptozoological beings, and the real problem here is that we no longer feel safe. So the antidote to not feeling safe, even in your own home, is divine protection. In the first case, the good news of the gospel of God is that you're worthy. In the second case, the good news of the gospel of God is that you are protected that God surrounds you, that he covers you, that he takes you under his arm, that we find shelter in the shadow of his wings. That no matter how real those creatures are, no matter how real those sex offenders are, you have someone on your side as an advocate, as a saver, as a messiah, and as a rescuer. Now, if I can pry and port this a little bit into video game world, but you'll forgive me because, you know, I'm trying seems to me that there's an awful lot of video games about protection, right? How about those levels in Resident Evil where you gotta look after somebody who's completely useless? Uh, <laughs> anytime you have to take care of a hostage or something yep. in a game, it is the worst. Yeah, I often just shoot them out of frustration. <laughs> over and over again, change, change the game's the won't let me. Yeah, that's it, you know, I just have fun, right? But that's a big thing, or tower defense games. I mean, protection is a big thing in games. Or if you've gotta have an item that you gotta protect or you gotta preserve, I'm playing Poke Tori on my iPad right now, I'm protecting those little boxes that you gotta throw in that you don't play this game. I'm, I'm too dorky for you. That's an achievement. I'd like to say thank you for shooting developers for setting the bar that much higher, right? There's always things that you have to protect. And we get so afraid that we have no protection, that we turn from God, that we turn to other things, or that we turn away. And the fact that we can be afraid is in itself a really powerful and controlling kind of uh, influence on in our lives. There's a family in our church, Jerry and Sherry and I, those are their real names because it's a good story and they're cool. They talk about the fact that they, for 20 years in their married life, always had one fear. The fear that their house would burn down. So every time they'd go away on vacation, they would unplug their stove, unplug their microwave, unplug their coffee maker. They would do everything to make sure their house was as fireproof as possible. They had people come over and check on their house every day because they had an unnatural fear that their house wouldn't be safe without them there to protect it. Well, what happened? Of course, it burned down. This last summer, their house burned to a crisp 
nothing left. They went out for dinner, they were gone for three hours, and in that three hours they lost every single one of their possessions. And I stood beside Jerry and Jerry on their front lawn, looking at the struck match of the last 20 years of their lives. And they said, you know what? Here we are, we've lost absolutely everything. And it's okay, because God has protected us. He didn't protect us from the fire. He protected us in the midst of the fire from being burned. How's that for real Jesus Jews, right? That's legit. That they're standing there, having lost everything, See, in our life, most of the time, we're concerned about whether or not we're going to get through the difficulty. That's not what God's concerned about. He's concerned about what you're going to get as you go through difficulty. Are you going to get bigger? Are you going to get stronger? Are you going to grow a spine? Are you going to get an identity? Are you going to get a personality? Are you going to get a sense of destiny, a sense of vision, a sense of dreams? Not are you going to keep your job for a week, but are you going to be the person that he has called and has destined and designed you to become in a year and five? We spend so much time in our lives, like Jerry and Sherry, worrying about, is our house going to burn down? Instead of recognizing that once their house burned down, that they found what their real possessions were. Their relationships, their love, their sense of support and family. All right. Can I move on? He can have it. Yes, Dave. Yes, you can. All right. Number three. The third kind of monster in the scripture are the apocalyptic monsters. You know what the word apocalypse means? In the world. Hidden. In the world. It's hidden. It also means Revelation, right? Do you know what the word monster means? It comes from the Latin monstro. It means to reveal. To be revealed. Apocalypse and monster have much the same root meaning. In both senses, in an apocalypse and with a monster, in their original words, the original etymology of both words refers to the fact that God is trying to teach people something by revealing something that is doesn't that reframe your whole understanding of monsters? And by the way, the book of Revelation in our Bible, right, the Apocalypse of St. John, is the most hugely misunderstood book, not only in the Christian tradition, but everywhere. So, you know, with, with all due respect to any of you, if you made the Left Behind game, but, you know, epic fail. You know, just a class A bed queen. Sorry. <laughs> but again, no offense. Right? But, you know, I mean that, you know, in, in the best kind of Christian brotherly love. Fine. But, okay, so, in the scriptures, the apocalyptic monsters, of course, are like the great serpent, which uh, kind of has, you know, all these heads, which is uh, kind of like a hydra. In fact, some of the confusion about Leviathan, as we mentioned earlier, about whether or not Leviathan has kind of his own salvation history, is that Leviathan was often thought to be a one-headed creature, but the creature in Revelation, pardon me, I think it's, it's a seven-headed creature thereby closely resembling Prince Yam or Wotan, these ancient Mesopotamian sort of serpentine deities, right? And so in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, you've got these, you've got that weird leopard-headed creature, you know, that comes out of the beast out of the sea. And what's the purpose of all these apocalyptic monsters? Is to reveal, finally, what's right and what's wrong, and what the long-term effects of rightness and wrongness Really are. So I get really nervous when I hear people interpreting Revelation and going, oh, Gog and Magog, well, that's like Russia and Afghanistan. I mean, I'm not sure if the Antichrist is, well, maybe it's Gaddafi, or maybe it's Saddam Hussein. That really would be a trick. Or, you know, maybe it's, it's people say it's our president. I mean, come on, really? Really? I mean, you're, you're way overreaching here. But I think it is absolutely safe for us to say that all these monsters, the beast, the false prophet, all that jazz, it's absolutely credible for us to say that those apocalyptic monsters are personifications of what men will inevitably become when they are the final authority. When they choose to hold their own row and go on without God, when they choose to lead in the absence of Christ and they depart from the plan of God to heal the world and rebirth creation on earth as it is in heaven, right? When they do their own deal, that's where they end up as distortion monstrosities, as things that leave people running and screaming for terror. So what's God revealing in the revelation with those monsters? Not that those monsters are somehow good, but God is giving us a picture of what tyrants really are like on the inside, what their 
like spiritually, what they're like socially, what they're like economically, and what they're ultimately going to be like in reality when left to their own devices unchecked for a long time. Now, I said that there's another kind of apocalyptic monster in there. Remember what I said? Because I don't. I probably need to change. Uh, <laughs> okay, no. What I said was there's another kind of apocalyptic monster in the scriptures. It's God. Right? Mm -hmm. Right? Now, you know, there is a certain kind of Christian that loves kind of the blood and gore. You know the kind of person I'm talking about? The kind of Christian who's going, <laughs> yeah, it's him. Yeah. <laughs> it's the kind of Christian, you know, who gets all excited about the judgment passages. The kind of Christian who loves to quote the most hateful, destructive, like terrifying punishment from God upon sinner. You know this kind of guy, right? You've got his podcasts, I'm sure, right? You've been to his website. And it's the guy who loves to just throw the scriptures like shuriken out at all the people who are, you know, not like them, who are sinning in some way, who are of a different lifestyle or whatever. And they just, like, use the scriptures like sniper ammo all over the place. And they're decimating other people. Now, sometimes that's rightfully, uh, that's rightly applied with a wrong heart and a, right, a wrong attitude. But more often than not, what I think it really betrays is a kind of desire for God to be vengeful and bloodthirsty beyond any of the vengeance or retribution we ever see accurately portrayed in Scripture. And so they have this picture of God as a, a great blower upper in the sky. And I think that what's really behind this picture is a fear that God is not good or that they have not really been forgiven. You guys have kids, right? When my kids do bad stuff, they'll often try and like, you know, throw the other one under the bus, right? Like if I come into the room and there's a big mess everywhere, there's some toys out, but then like recently, you know, somebody has painted the carpet with a roller and a brush, right? Well, if it was my son that made the mess with toys, but my daughter that did the rolling, what's my son do? Well, I was her dad. I just, I just left out these brown. It's like your daughter is a wicked harpy. <laughs> she wrote the dragon in Revelation and painted the carpet. Right? That's what my son does. He distances himself quickly saying, yeah, I screwed up, but I didn't screw up like her. I mean, she's the real spawn of Satan here. Well, I think that's what's going on with these people who love to throw around these hateful scriptures. As they go, yeah, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. But all I did was say, damn, this guy's gay. He screwed. Like, that's what they're doing. Is they're leveling everything. And they're playing off their, you know, comparatively little sins against somebody else's comparatively somehow larger sins. But of course, if we read the scriptures and understand it at all, we know that it's all baloney, right? The ground is all level at the cross. It doesn't matter what word you say or what lifestyle you live. You need the grace of Jesus Christ and you need the blood of the cross or you're hooped. You're a super lightning hoop. So everybody who plays this little game of like, oh, I'm not so sucky as that guy. I mean, those guys are really, well, they're really courting judgment in a certain sense, but more than anything, it's because it's, it's motivated by this fear that they really haven't been forgiven. Or that God really isn't good like he says he is. And so they're playing this game where they're trying to convince God that they're on his side. And I suggest to you that that's one of the most dominant themes in Christian hate in America. It's like, yeah, I'm bad, but I'm not as bad as that guy. Very, very dangerous. And so, of course, what is the antidote? this kind of fear. If the antidote to false gods and false authority was being found in the word of God, and if the antidote to the things out there was being found to be protected, then I think the antidote to this kind of leveling and this kind of like apocalyptic hoo-ha is really understanding that you're loved. Because the root of it, you got to just know and trust and thank God. why when Jesus talks, he talks so much about love. Understanding the way in which we're meant to relate to each other, the way in which we're meant to relate to our creation, the way in which we're meant to relate to God in heaven, and the way in which we're even meant to relate to ourselves ought to be marked and defined by love. Because he's trying to keep us from all these other games about how relatively sinless we are in comparison to the next generation. Alright, the last kind of monster in the scripture. The 
monsters of idols. Now, what are idols? Anybody remember? That seems like a terrible thing to do with spelling bee for. You know? Little carving. Yeah, little wooden carvings, right? Stones, totems, whatever, right? Idols are the monsters we make ourselves. Anybody know why there's a prohibition against idols in the first testament? God says, don't make idols. It maketh him mad. Why? <laughs> he's jealous, yeah, but he's jealous in two directions. He doesn't want to compete with worship for something else, but God already made idols. And then over the first place idols, or the word idol is mentioned. Yeah? Uh, when Moses puts the rod up? No, but very handsomely incorrect. <laughs> Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28, God says, Let us create man in our own image and likeness. God says, Let us make man as our idols. Now that word salem, right? That's the word for image. Okay? It means a number of things. It means like us, but it also means idol. And it also means shadow. I got a book out there, I got the book on monsters, but I also got a book out there about shadow and God. I think the best way for us to understand Christian spirituality is to define ourselves as shadows of God. What is a shadow? It's a less dimensional facsimile of something else. You ever photocopy your face? Right? I got a little four-year-old daughter, and when I take her to work with me, she's so cute. All the other ladies at the office take her, they photocopy her bum and left it on the desk. I'm like, that's gross. <laughs> but that's what we are to God. We are less dimensional copies of God. We're like less. We are like God. We ought to give us a great feeling of dignity. We are like the creator of the universe, above whom there is none other. There is no one else like him but us. Animals aren't like him. Trees aren't like him. No flora, no fauna, no planet, no creation except us. And God has made us to be his idols in the world. Idols that move. Do you know what the purpose of idols were in the ancient world? There were two political purpose, and there was also a religious purpose. The political purpose is when a king would erect idols of himself all around the border of his ancient kingdom. So, for example, instead of going through the 49th parallel from the United States into Canada and going through a little toll booth, right, with the polite Canadian guy, you know, takes your order, <laughs> gives you citizenship or whatever, right, they would pass through giant statues of the king around. And when you went by those markers, you now knew that you were living under the authority of the new sovereign. When people see you, they are supposed to recognize that they live under the authority of God. You're meant to be a border marker, a signpost to everybody else that wherever you go, God is in charge. And there was a spiritual or a religious aspect to idols as well. You'd go into an ancient temple, you'd make offerings to an idol. I was recently in India and they have a temples full of idols all over the place, right? And when you went into the temple and you sat in front of the idol and you made an offering, you were said to be in the presence of that faith. You, to the rest of the world, are meant to be the movable presence of Christ. When people are around you, they are supposed to feel him. That's the significance of idols. So when God says, don't make idols, it's not just because he doesn't want you to worship them instead of him. It's because he doesn't want you to be cheap. He doesn't want you to be diminished. He doesn't want to have your humanity or even your divine resemblance in some way deteriorate or be removed. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't even mean that. That's what's so neat. That's cool. <laughs> it's not as cool as making video games, but you know, we do what we can. <laughs> All right. So that's the fourth kind of monster in the scriptures, are the monsters of our making, you know, the idols. Now, there's, of course, a whole flip side, like a whole side and a note of hope to the fact that we have the power to create alongside our creator. Sometimes we use that power in aberrant ways, like creating idols. Sometimes we use that power in regenerative, good ways, where we make not bad things, but we make create healthy things, art, stories, music, things that act as signposts toward our creator. Now, in the early Christian tradition, there are a number of fabrications, okay? 
fake stories, legends, that are among the coolest stories ever. Now, there's some debate as to whether or not anybody believed these stories at the beginning, but nobody believes these stories now. So we're gonna treat them as kind of Christian myths, and I wanna tell you two, okay? They concern, first and foremost, they concern the satyr that lived inside of Alexandria, and then secondly, St. Christopher the Cenocephalon. These are the good kind of monsters that Christian people began making in the third and fourth century. These were the first, like, Tolkien films. Before there was Beowulf, there was St. Anthony and the Satyr. Before there was the Lord of the Rings, there was St. Christopher, the Cenocephalon. I mean, this, this is Christian monster movies told over and over again in all these little movies. <coughs> so, once upon a time, about uh, 280, 290, somewhere in that third, fourth century mark, right? St. Anthony, who's living in Alexandria, gets a hurried messenger who comes to him and says, there's a huge problem, what's the problem? There's a satyr, half man, half goat, living out in the woods, and all the people from Alexandria are going into the woods to pay homage to the satyr. They're worshiping him, and he has set himself up as a rival deity, stealing from Yahweh. And St. Anthony says, no way, man, not on my watch. So like those cool French guys in Brotherhood of the Wolf, he gets on his cloak and he grabs his staff and he marches off. Oh, yeah. He marches into the woods to confront the satyr. It takes him several days to find him. Finally, he locates the beast who's hiding in a den in a dark place of the woods. And he says, I've come here to confront you on behalf of Jesus. And the satyr says, St. Anthony, I'm so relieved that you're here. I've been running from the townspeople over and over again for the last month because I came to Alexandria to meet you and learn of Christ, my maker who made me, who made me good, The second story that I think is, is really, really cool is about St. Christopher. Now, if you grew up Catholic, then of course you've heard of St. Christopher, he's the patron saint of, you know, uh, lost yeah, what is it, lost things? Travelers? I don't know. I didn't grow up Catholic. It doesn't even, uh, it, that's not the cool part of the story, so it doesn't even matter. But in the Orthodox tradition, uh, St. Christopher has this whole other, like, story. In fact, if you go on and, and Google or do a Google image search for Cenocephalus, spelled with a C, or, St. Christopher, you'll get all these icons from the Russian Orthodox and Eastern Orthodox Church of Christopher as a werewolf. Cenocephali literally means dog head. And so the story goes that round about Antioch, the Roman legionnaires were pushing their way north into what is now France and Germany, up into Gaul. And they came up against a particularly fierce group of barbarians, Cenocephali. They were werewolves who had the heads of wolves and the bodies of people, and they wielded double-bladed battle axes, and were kicking the Roman legionaries' butts all up and down. Finally, because of their superior technology and weaponry, the Roman legionaries were able to conquer the Cenocephali and lead them back to Antioch in slavery. Christopher was one of these dogheads, and he was placed in jail in Antioch. He only spoke the dogheaded language, barks and growls and all that kind of jazz, but in prison, he heard the good news supernaturally empowered with the ability to speak Koine, the common language of the realm. And Christopher began to evangelize in the jails so that all of the dogheads became lovers and followers of Jesus Christ. And because they were such barbarians, and because they were such savages, and because they were beyond so much redemption and considered way on the outskirts of any human civilization, they started a revival. And they broke out of prison and lived kind of like Robin Hood out in the woods around Antioch, and they would come into the town and evangelize. I mean, just werewolf evangelists, stay with me. Right? They would come into the town and evangelize, and there was a massive revival in Antioch because of the dog head. And it got to the point that the emperor ordered that anybody who would convert would be beheaded. But this didn't stop the revival. And so people were getting snatched out of their homes, and you were getting like one or two or three or five people killed in a day, and it got to the point that 10 
10,000 people he converted, and I want to say it's either 11 or 1,700 people were executed in one day because of the preaching of St. Christopher. That Christopher finally came and gave himself up and was publicly executed in his prayer, saying, I want this last sermon to count in my life. Now again, full baloney, right? Like, there were no werewolves. But the story is representative of the fact that early Christian artists and storytellers were looking for an angle. They were looking for a way to say, look, God changes us. We're all werewolves. We're all beasts. We're all hairy, uncouth, ogres and thugs. We can't communicate with others. We can't barely get along. We're violent all the time until the good news is the gospel of God comes and changes us. The spirit of God fills us up and transforms us from the inside out. So instead of being barbarians, we are people who lay down our lives for others. Now these are the good titles. So, the first kind of monster was a false god. And the antidote to that false authority was worthy. You were worthy. The second kind of monster were those cryptids, Leviathan, Behemoth, and all that jazz. And the antidote to the fear that comes with what's out there is the idea that you're protected. The third kind of monster was these apocalyptic monsters in which we get afraid that God might not really be good or that we might not really be good. And the antidote to that kind of fear is that we are loved. And the last fear was fear of idols and the way they would take hold of people and drive people to these deaths is that we are powerful. God has given some of his power on the one to the power to create, power to heal, power to call those things which are not as though they are according to Romans, power to change and shape your life and the lives of people, right. power to shape destiny, power to make we could also brand new things, power to change and power to heal. So that's what I want to leave good news of the gospel of God is that you are worthy, protected, loved, and accomplished. And there's a whole lot more that we can say about that, but I'm just going to try and rein it in a bit, give you a chance to ask some questions. I'll do my best to answer them. And then um, I told somebody before I came that I would try and, and give, you know, my true sense for where I think, you know, what a Christian video game is and what a Christian video game does. And so I'll end up with that, but I think Curious, just from from this uh, this four kind of monsters thing, where do you put critters like demons in? Like, where does this fit in that picture? Oh yeah, you know, I'm I'm at a church right now that that uh, <clears throat> what's the good way to put it? You know, they but before I got there, they were real anti supernaturalists. Wow, and I'm not. <laughs> you can tell, you know. <laughs> so we've kind of been easing into this conversation. You know, I try and be intellectually pastoral. I try and help people. Um, so I would put demons in a whole category. Okay. Yeah. And I think, you know, Craig Boyd's got this book, um, a Craig Boyd, great theologian out in uh, Minneapolis, and he's got a book, um, Satan and um, uh, uh, Satan and the Problem of Evil, a Trinitarian Warfare Theodicy. Wow. I think it's one of the best books about spiritual warfare. I'm a fast reader. I probably read 200 books in a year, and it took me maybe six months to work through that book. I mean, it's just, it's a weighty tome. Um, but I think the Bible presents just a freaky amount of supernatural activity and we recognize there are really you know there's really our world and there's really God's world and there's a world in between populated largely by malevolent spiritual personages and the angelic forces that come that against them so yeah if you grew up in a charismatic church and you always felt like I did growing up in a charismatic church that their theology was kind of the pits it is but there's actually something really credible behind Yeah, the other books, like, uh, well, immediately when I saw the monster book, I'm like, this is like the D&D continuum. This is supposed to be, you know, like, you have, like, Angel One or a, another, do you have other ones that are in the works? Or? Uh, you know, we, at, at our church, maybe four years ago, I, I realized that much of the prep work that I would do for a sermon series would just get lost. And so what I started doing is writing books in advance. And so typically, uh, every eight weeks, I'll lock myself in my basement for a week and write a book. Uh, on whatever topic, because I know I'm only going to get to preach maybe 30% of it. Um, so in the last four years, we've put up 40. Wait. Um, so of those, now I have two other guys that sometimes teach, so of those, I think 35 or 36 I've done, and they've done so, a few. Wait, you lock yourself in for a week and write a 
write a book? Yeah. Yeah. Look at, look, at, look at how smart I am. <laughs> That's not fair. Yeah, no, it's a, well, you know, uh, whether or not whether or not I can write them and whether or not anybody reads them, those are different things. <laughs> uh, I do have, in, in terms of the supernatural, we did one on uh, Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones that talks a lot about resurrection, and uh, that book's called Bleached. And then we did another, and this book Shadow and God talks a lot about the image of God stuff. Um, and, and, um, I just finished going this whole last year, starting uh, at Halloween. With, well, I grew up Pentecostal, so I didn't know anything with us. So we did a whole year-long look at the Christian liturgical calendar. Um, so there's, I don't want to say five or six of those that are like Advent, Common Time, uh, Easter Time, all that stuff. And then they're coming out in one big boat anchor uh, soon. So, but yeah, Bleach to my life. Second Testament, yes, that's the role they played. In the First Testament, they weren't, it wasn't quite so neat and tidy. I mean, the Old Testament's a mess, right? Like, it's a bunch of guys writing a bunch of things 2,400 years, most conservatively, apart from each other. So they all, they all didn't have, like, one game plan. There was no game design document for them, okay? They were all just making crap up as they went along as the Spirit gave them utterance and all that. So there wasn't really one sharply defined goal. But in the New Testament, because the timeline is so short, because they all knew Jesus, and they all knew you know, what the gospel was and what they were trying to pound out, the, the, the things are much more clearly connected. So apocalyptic monsters, yeah, they're revelatory. In the Old Testament, it's a little more scattered. As to your question is, can monsters play that role now? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, not everything bad is bad. Uh, Dracula, I mean, Bram Stoker's Dracula novel, is just brilliant. In fact, there's a big section in Monsters where I talk about the theology of Dracula. And he quotes from Deuteronomy in that book, from Dracula himself quotes four or five times from Deuteronomy. You will now be blood of my blood and flesh of my flesh. You are my bride. I have clothed to you. I mean, it's just eerie, right? <laughs> and he's not supposed to be good. He's bad. He's like Satan, right? But the whole point is that you, you set up this adversary that is scary, and you show how the power of Christ is even greater. Now, I watched the Exorcist movie, right? Uh, the power of Christ compels you. Right? Yeah. But but what you come away with it in the end is faith from Because you go, okay, yeah, he went a little nuts and jumped out of the window at the end. But but you know, <laughs> he, he had a little flesh still in there. But 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 the power of Christ is greater. And uh, go ahead, is it Kelly? And, yeah. And um, this this thing about Dracula and quoting scripture is also actually kind of adds to his creepiness because it's like he thinks he's a false god. That's yeah. what it adds to it. It just really sets in that this guy is, I mean, it's like, he thinks that he's a false god, basically. Yeah. Well, you know where all the, like, the wooden stake stuff comes from, right? Those are supposed to be pieces of the cross, and that's why, they, you know, he burns it up. Mm. Too cool for school, right? My, my son is, uh, I have two kids, Jacob, who's uh, about to turn eight, and Anna, who just, just turned five. And, uh, and Jacob and I, we do a lot of theology together. It's really fun. Because I want to introduce him to all this stuff that like I never got to learn until way later, you know. So we dork out and we tell stories. And, um, we were talking about something, and, and my wife's dad, my father-in-law, who's not a believer, overheard us. I don't remember what we were talking about. I want to say like Transformers or something, you know, or you know the relative merits of Michael Bay. And, and, uh, and, uh, and so he got in his mind that like because we were talking about that Transformers, like PG, that he would tell my son a bedtime story. So Carmel and I were out on the deck and talking, and Grandpa goes in with Jake and starts telling him about Dracula. And it scared the crap out of my kid like for <laughs> a month, I want to say. He couldn't sleep. And so I started teaching Jake of everything that you know we talked about in brief today. And I started telling him, I know maybe 50 little legends like these ones about the Santa Sepulchre and stuff. And so I started telling him all these <laughs> early Christian legends. And I started teaching him in child-appropriate ways, right? truly cosmic Jesus is. Remember that the story of the Bible is first cosmic and then anthropological, right? It's not about saving men's souls. It's about defeating Satan and ridding creation of evil. That's not just a human story that's in the 
psychological story, and it's also much more important than cosmic story, right? So we start telling him all this stuff. And one of the greatest, happiest moments of my fatherhood was one night I climb into bed with Jake, you know, or I climb on top of his covers, and I get ready to tell him a bedtime story, you know, about some other, you know, Chris Deuce Victor or some weird theological point. He says, Dad, it's cool, I know it. Jesus keeps the monsters away. <laughs> and it's like this little mantra in our house, you know, Jesus keeps the monsters away. And that's it. And it's, there's monsters, they're real. Yeah. But so is he. And he's so much more powerful. Have you ever read the book of Enoch? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I've read the uh, first, second, and fourth Enoch. Yeah. That's neat. <laughs> yeah. Well, that whole tradition, the Gregory tradition, the Watcher tradition, right. is a big deal. There's, a, there's been a bunch of games about it. There's one, Ascent of the Metatron, that's getting ready to come out that borrows a lot from El Shaddai. PS3, El Shaddai, yeah. yeah. Uh, that borrows a lot yeah. from all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, Enoch, uh, there's a whole, I mean, uh, I want to say there's three instances in the, in the Bible, both Testaments, where uh, people are translated, or they don't die and go to heaven, they just go to heaven, Enoch being the first. And there's a whole Jewish mystical tradition about the, the Merkabah throne chariot of God, the fiery throne chariot of God. And in the Jewish mystical tradition, people would get caught up in his throne chariot and oftentimes taken to heaven. And like Enoch in 2 Enoch and 4 Enoch in particular, he talks about judging the angels and seeing their deeds. The people in the Merkabah tradition would be taken up and given this picture of what goes on in the heavenly realms. And then oftentimes were returned back to earth and then never permitted to speak about it. So they had this sort of like otherworldly <laughs> air, this knowledge, and people would revere them, you know, as shamans or, you know, whatever, you know, wizards or Gandalfs or whatnot, and, but they weren't ever allowed to talk about what they have seen. And, uh, and uh, Jim, oh, hang on, I'm drawing a blank on his name, it'll, it'll come to me, um, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the sort of leading New Testament scholars concerning the invisible world and the supernatural talks about the fact that when, when Paul refers to the thorn in his side, that he's not referring to his blindness, as some people often thought, or his potential divorce, as some have said, or even his limp, as others have said. But what he's referring to is to him being caught up in the Merkabah throne chariot and taken up into the third heaven. Remember, Paul tells that story, right? I've got this friend. i got this friend. Did you get drunk all the time? i got this friend who was carried up by God into the third heaven who has seen things. You know, and so that's the, that's the little weird. Now, again, yeah. who knows? Don't bank your faith on it, but it's a cool... It's good one. Yeah, it's cool. It's a cool story. Good <laughs> Any other questions? Anybody have to do Google ahead? How do you think that we, we, we posted on the CGC site this, this idea about, about unicorns, just basically, yeah. we just kind of hinted at this on the, the, on the site. And it was remarkable to get people just playing on that. And then, uh, I'm like, you're mad at you? For yeah, like, there are not unicorns in the Bible. I'm proof. I mean, they, they flipped out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the, the right answer was to uh, appropriately ignore that. You know, <laughs> but I was curious. You must see this. There's a response sometimes. This, this concept that that Leviathan, for example, would even have a story, and he just rubs some people the wrong way. Why do you think that is? Well, it's fear. Totally. Yeah. I mean, totally. We live in an age. I mean, uh, uh, dark green guy, spoke second day, heart guy, heart man. Uh, Gary Parker. Gary. Hartman had it right, okay? We live in an age of total disorientation. In the midst of disorientation, what people crave is certainty, and they lock onto it, and once they've got it, they've got it, and screw you if you try and take it away from them. But life isn't quite so certain. And if you study the scriptures, and I have a very, very high view of scripture, okay? I'm not, I'm not looking to disregard the authority of scripture in the woods, right? I have a very high view of scripture. But what is the scripture? Well, it's God breathed through people, which means because it comes through people, it's going to sound like the individual people. Because it comes through people, sure. it's going to be limited in some ways, not in all ways, but in some ways to their experience, to their metaphors. Nobody there is going to write about a Sherman tank because they don't know what it is. If they saw a Sherman tank in a vision, they're still going to try and describe it in ways that make sense to a pre-industrialized agrarian society, right? The Bible is full of all kinds of different literary genres, and most times when people read the scripture, they don't think about that at all. They don't think about the 40 different authors. They don't think about the 2,400 years it took to write it. They don't think about which parts are, are meant as stories. Like they, in the Old Testament especially, they make no distinction between um, like a historical document or a document of war or a political document or legal writing.
writing or vision or apocalypse. They, they don't make any distinction there at all. In the New Testament, it's a lot easier because Jesus tells parables and they're in red ink. So we know, okay, they're really, you know, <laughs> he's not really a door. I get it, right? But in the Old Testament, we don't have that help, right? So, so people read everything as, you know, as a one-to-one -one correlation with rules to be obeyed. They don't interpret. They don't understand what they're reading. And they get really scared if you start to uh, needle with that because they're afraid that you're only one or two steps away from saying that's all just a big fiction. Who cares? It doesn't really matter. You know, all you're really going to do is read the red and skip the rest. Well, I'm not there at all. But I would like to say for those people who are afraid of that, there's an awful lot more steps than just one between reading the words off the page and reading the words off the page and correctly interpreting them and disregarding all the words on the page and doing whatever you want. So yeah, I have an opinion. <laughs> yes. Do you, did it, do you want me to try and connect this anymore to video games? I mean, you can do that way more. Probably anything that I can play is probably way less cool than what you're making in your pajamas. You know, but how about you do it? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, I'll tell you. Here, here's some of the most spiritual video games I think in the last few years. Okay, I mean, for, for what it's worth, um, uh, Heavy Rain for the PS3. I think it was a, it was a brilliantly emotional and moral game where you had to make choices about what you're willing to do. When you play as a character of Ethan, the dad, right? You guys you familiar with this game? Yeah. No. Right? Okay, it's like, it's like a crime noir kind of scene. Uh, a little boy is kidnapped and everybody's looking for him. So you play four independent stories. You play as his dad, you play as a private detective, you play as a police, like an FBI guy, and you play as a, a, a journalist. And you're all looking for this boy. And the dad is also a suspect in the murder. And each of the stories plays independent of the other, and your character can die partway through the game. And if they die, they can stay dead. So you just don't find out what happened. Now there's a way to cheat and go back and do it again so you don't die, but I can watch them kill off. But especially when you're playing the dad, you have to make all these moral choices, these really difficult moral choices about whether or not you're gonna find clues to save your son or whether or not you're gonna hurt somebody else or whether or not you're gonna hurt yourself. And there's real consequences in the game, so I thought that was great. Uh, Echo Chrome, I'm a PS3 guy, so Echo Chrome on the PSN was a game all about perspectivism. And uh, you had these little simple models and you could you know, move the camera around, basically where the camera looked. Yeah, this was really, um, uh, I think all the, uh, Anything that deals with the supernatural or the invisible world, I'm almost always a fan of. Did you ever play Shadow of Colossus? Probably? Yeah, that was great. That game was great. Oh, I, I, I had bought a PS3, yeah. and I was playing that. Yeah. And why did I buy a PS3? This game was great. Yeah, because it was I, like a PS2 game or something. Yeah, it was. Go over, right? yeah. It was actually very minimal, too, and, and how it presented. And I've never, I rarely experienced that in a game. I usually get bored now from things that are lengthy. But yeah, the whole game was Lost Hours. Yeah. Basically, yeah. this Colossus is where yeah, so there was your horse. Oh, yeah, you were just fighting these huge goliaths. Yeah. I thought it was very unique how they presented like this. They had an unknown god or something talking to you. And it was really like not yeah. what I played before, and I really wanted to see where it was going. And oh yeah, it just yeah. Oh yeah, it was very Eastern. Yeah, very Eastern. This yeah, it was. All that. It, it was very Final Fantasy like. Final Fantasy, a game I know. Why, 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 <laughs> keywords. <laughs> you could, uh, <laughs> Uh, well, let me let me jump into this into this. I, I have two pieces that are, are unrelated, you know, are only loosely related to monsters. Um, so let me share these two pieces with you. And if you want to interrupt or go in another direction, that's cool too. But I just think that, you know, for what it's worth, here's my two cents on games. Okay. Um, the first piece is what games can and can't do. I think from a Christian or theological perspective. And the second piece is, um, you know, kind of this, not that. You know, I think games can do this, but not that. So first. Um, I don't think games can evangelize, and I don't think games can disciple. And I think, in my experience as a dad, as a, I've never used this term publicly before, I'm coming out as a gamer. Did I just get pimples right now? <laughs> as a dad, as a gamer, and as a kid growing up whose parents were concerned about video games, that's what they were always worried about. You know, does it evangelize? Does it disciple? If it doesn't make new Christians or make better Christians, it can't therefore be Christian. Um, but games just, they don't do that. And lots of things don't. Christian literature. Who cares? Those aren't the only twin purposes of the scriptures. I would have to disagree with half of that. I, I think that evangelism. I only said two things. 
I think the evangelizing thing, you have a good point on, because a lot of times when people try to evangelize through games or visual media, it turns into a big Bible track, and it's just annoying, and atheists laugh at it. But as far as discipleship, I have found times where I have played the story of a game, and I have been able to relate moral pieces of it or spiritual allegories or parts of it to my own life, and I do feel those have helped me have a better connection with God. Yeah. So I, I think so. I, I mean, I, let, let me define it. Yeah, I don't disagree with what you said. I just mean when we when we pick games, the discipleship tool. Here's how you're gonna learn the fruits of the spirit. Here's how you're gonna. Yeah, if you're scripture. purposefully if doing a, it, it usually doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think also there's a, there's another aspect of that too. Because I mean, there's there's pieces of, of art. There's there's movies that I can watch that I that I know aren't aren't Christian in nature whatsoever. There's games that I play. Yes, they're they're hyper violent, and you know they just they have images of just you know <clears throat> massive destruction and, and whatever. However, there are elements that are extremely inspiring, and I think the elements of it that are inspiring is not necessarily the content per se, but everybody's been given gifts without repentance. Everybody's anointed in some way to operate in those gifts, and I think what lifts off the page or off the screen are when you see somebody exercising a God given gift without repentance. And I think that's what, at least for me, and I can only speak for myself, what my spirit latches onto is knowing the source of where that came from. Now, of course, it's being influenced and interpreted in a different way. The true source is, is what I immediately focus on and I can appreciate it from that. Yeah. So you can still grab holy nuggets and truths and inspiration from something that isn't contextually Christian. Well, that's, I wasn't that's kind of what I was saying is I grab those nuggets and I still feel like that's helping me in discipleship whether it's intended to or not. I think it sounds like you were intending it as talking about them purposefully trying to do that with the games, right? That's where I felt like I got mixed up because I think of... Nobody's mad at you. It's okay. I didn't think anybody was mad at me. I was just trying to explain <laughs> myself. If you guys are mad at me, then I've been to the wrong conference. We're doing discussion here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Perfect. a little skinny. Okay, it's a little skinny talk about unicorns for an hour. Right? We love you. Yeah. The, the purpose of the game, I don't think, can successfully be discipleship. But if we are connected to God and the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, then everything is discipleship. I mean, you don't want to like a substitute, like putting kids from a TV all day as a babysitter. Yeah. You don't want to disciple ba babysitting. Yeah, that's right. Discipleship yeah. babysitting. Here, kids. Disciple yourselves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're a little, a little early, but yeah. uh, here's what I think games can do, though. I think games can can re almost any kind of thing. They can reframe. They can help us reimagine. I think games can retell. I think games can uh, reintroduce. And I think those those are all like those are all super legit. You know, I think I think you, you made a comment about atheists, and um, you know, honestly, nothing we ever say or do is ever gonna like make atheists love us. Or, or not ridicule us. Tell me about it. You know, we're just three easy targets. Sorry, just give them one. Yeah, I mean, so love them, be their buddies, and just don't look for credibility from them. Uh, your worth can't come from somebody oh. who believes that everything is, is baloney. I'm just saying, you can't, not for you. You're, you're perfect. Okay. <laughs> um, but I think if we can interrupt the uh, over scientific, over enlightenment perspectives of much of our world, which I think gaming does just inherently. I think things like you know fringe and way back in the day the X Files. I think those things do it inherently. That's a win for us if we can disrupt this and open people up to alternate dimensions, alternate possibilities, alternate timelines, the invisible world. I think that's a win because now we have a playground in which to share the gospel. And I think our culture is really open to the supernatural, uh, and that's fantastic because our story is a supernatural story. It's just that for the last 400 years we've kind of tried to make it into a calculus equation so that we're more respectable. It's a mistake, especially now. Uh, yeah? Well, I've been involved in um, entertainment projects like plays or uh, animation or video game where you can really sense that the spirit has, has moved through the medium to uh, convict you maybe of a character flaw or um, you know, to, uh, to um, bring some understanding about uh, challenges Well, I mean, yeah, I think when, I, when somebody sits down and 
they say, let's make a video game to make better Christians. I think they're in trouble. When somebody says, and, and this is this is kind of a larger philosophical question, okay? So whether we're talking about film, or whether we're talking about movies, or whether we're talking about just individual people, I think the quest for us as human beings is to say, God, who have you called me to be, and what do you want me to do? And I think to be great storytellers, or to be great game designers, or to be great filmmakers, we have to put on our imagination hat and go, God, who is this person? What have you called this person, even though they're not real, to do? And who have you called them to be? And how are they either being faithful to that or not faithful to that? And what happens as a result? And if you can create real characters and put them in real scenarios and kind of let those characters live and come to life, you're going to have a fantastically compelling story with a billion teachable moments. If you did it in Genesis, you can do it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, for, for, you know, and, and I don't want to stretch it too far, but you're actually right. Yeah. Like, he made us to be like him. He's a maker. We're makers like him. Not quite as cool, but writing, sub cool. Writing really is a way for us to, I hope I'm not interrupting, I'm sorry. Writing really is a way for us to kind of get in touch with like, why do we do, we ask God, why does he let bad things happen to us? Why do we let bad things happen to our characters? Simple, because they need to go through them. Why, I see, I mean, I'm, I'm so guilty of this. I write these characters into their own little horrible lives. I make their lives as bad as possible. But when something bad happens to me that's going to develop my character, God, why would you do this? I thought you loved me, and I get like that. And God just has to remind me, what are you doing to your characters? That's funny. <laughs> uh, I, got, I got seven minutes here. Uh, here's, I mean, for what it's worth, like, I don't make video games. I wish I could. I totally wish I could. But, uh, for what it's worth, here's my two cents. I think if you want to make games, here's the, the this, not that categories that in my experience, just looking at not only Christian games, but bad games, and as this was just a little footnote, we all, we all understand that Christian isn't an adjective, right? Like, Christian game, basically, you might as well just say, oops, I, all, I already made it sucky game, you know? I mean, we just want to reframe that as a noun, right? I am a Christian, I'm not a Christian man, I'm a Christian, I'm a lover and a follower of Jesus, right? So anyway, so all that, here's, here's kind of the common pitfalls I see, and here I think how we should replace them. Five, five uh, pairs, okay? Um, so first, uh, you, you want to strive for metaphor, not pedagogy. So you, you don't want to indoctrinate somebody. You want to, you want to give a metaphor. You tell a big story. Um, so like, you know, Star Wars is in bounds. Uh, you know, World of Warcraft can be in bounds. Orcs can be in bounds. All kinds of things can be in bounds in metaphor that can't be in bounds in an indoctrination. Okay, track with me. Okay, number two. Um, I think you want to think mythology, not information. You want people to be caught up in the epic scope and sequence and the movement and the ebb and flow, not in the facts. Um, it's related to the verse, but it's slightly different. Okay, number three, um, if you're really looking for a way to familiarize people with the biblical story, which I think is totally noble and awesome, right? Um, I think the best way to do that is not chapter and verse or even like, you know, taking the page and putting it to life. I think alternate history is a great way to do that. So the NBC series Kings that came out a couple years ago that was canceled after a year, I thought that was a brilliant reworking of the David and Saul and the Goliath mythology. That was just gorgeous. Now it got panned because it had some things in it that were offensive to evangelicals and that was kind of their, you know, that was their money making base. So you can't really alienate your market, but still an, an alternate timeline. And think about this. Remember, when David is fleeing from Saul, where does he go and hide? He goes and hides in the caves in the Middle East. Do we know anybody else that hides in caves in the Middle East? Yeah. <laughs> yes, we do. Like, I think we have a cultural meme that we can work with there to reframe the story in a new way. Um, and I think we can do that in, like, in almost limitless ways with biblical stories. Um, uh, I used to be a worship pastor, and part of my job at my former church was to write and produce four the theatrical productions a year. So in the couple years I was a music pastor, I maybe did 12. Um, and always the ones that were my favorites, the ones I really want, wanted to make were the ones that got rejected. Um, so, you know, I wanted to make the, this isn't anything to do with what I'm saying, but I really wanted to make, but wasn't allowed to make the story of a church putting on a church play, but they want to make it awesome. So they hire a professional actor to play Jesus and he gets saved during the production of the play. Like he's on the cross, the pastor's giving the altar call. Who wants to become a Christian and accept Jesus? 
<laughs> I almost got fired. I thought that was really good. Anyway, the other idea that I was really in love with was reframing the whole story of Jesus and his disciples in a, in a private school, an all boys private school. Because uh, I just thought if you can put, if you, if you just can, because you got all the, the trappings of, of Orthodox Judaism, and you got, you got a ready made group of authority and Pharisees and Sadducees and a whole system of corporal punishment, and you've got, you know, you know, some of Jesus' followers were really young, and there was all kinds of problems with women, and Jesus being involved with women. So you get, you know, just that, you know, that kind of that kind of scenario allows you to tell the story almost verbatim, just by changing the costumes, and, and allows people to see it again. Okay, uh, number four. Uh, I think if you want to tell Christian stories, you got to tell cosmic stories, not anthropological stories. So you can't it can't be just about. Like, it's only been, what, 15, 20 years that we figured out the Bible has something to say about the planet? I mean, come on, really? Like, really? We need, we need the liberal media to remind us that we've got, you know, 4,000 years worth of ecology and our sacred texts. Like, really? Um, but it's there, man. It's there in spades. Um, and I think the next big thing will be, you know, animal rights, which, you know, as, as right-wing Christians, as most, as most Christians tend to be, you know, um, animal rights is a bit of a stretch. Ecology is still a bit of a stretch. Most of us are still told that the ozone layer is a myth. There's no such thing as the earth to be fine, right? I mean, this is kind of a, a big thing in evangelical circles. But, um, you know, another big thing that that'll, we're increasingly going to wake up to in the scriptures is the sort of sanctity of animal life and the high doctrine of creation, creation as it relates to dogs and cats and uh, things that bark. Uh, did you know that when human beings are created, we are created and God breathes his spirit into us, and when he breathes his spirit into us, we become a living soul. Okay? We're not souls until he breathes his breath into us. So there's a two-stage creation. We're made, and then we're given the, uh, and then we're made souls. We don't have souls, we are souls, properly speaking. But you know who has souls right from the beginning, who only has a one-stage creation, is animals. They are made of souls. And we become souls later on. How trippy is that? And that's not even like interpretation. That's just if you read the Bible in Hebrew, that's what it says. So what a mind job, right? And so anyway, I think the more we think about these kind of things, the more you think about the non-human story of salvation in the scriptures. You think angels, demons, it's been all that kind of more in heaven stuff, but of course there's so many more layers to that. You think about the mythology, you think about creation, you think about culture, you think about language. I think there's just an endless supply of stories there. Um, and then lastly, number five, and of course this one's kind of self-evident, but you know, really, if, if you wanna, if you wanna teach like your kids, um, or you wanna teach your youth group, you teach with themes and virtues. You don't teach them with uh, principles. Yeah. You teach, you know, you ease the care not the sin. You teach them about the best possible life how to have life abundant. And the way you do that is by teaching them about relationships. And that, everything in our world works on relationships. The four primary relationships are your relationship with yourself, your relationship with God, your relationship with others, your relationship with creation. I mean, everything is about relationships. And you can pull that out in stories so well because everything you do affects your relationship. Right? And when so many theologians and so many church people, and I would argue so many, you know, uh, Mediocre game designers get hung up on principles, right? We've got to get all the nouns right, we've got to get all the adjectives right, but that, that's missing the forest for the trees, man. Get the relationship right. So you know, you tell God you love Him, you stay close to Him. Everything you do, everything you do, and the way you live, it's not it's not about keeping rules. It's about being in love with Jesus. Um, and uh, I think that's a, a great way to go. One last quote: Philip Pullman, you know who he is? The Golden Compass. Right? Uh, huge children's book series in the UK. Um, Philip, Philip Pullman is a, a, a mean atheist, like a Christian barbecuing atheist. <laughs> and these books sold billions and billions of copies. Or maybe it doesn't matter. But they sold a lot. <laughs> but primarily, we're only successful in the UK because the States is still too Christianized, right? But he got up and, and uh, in his, in his uh, lecture at Harvard for the commencement speech for the undergrad, he was asked to do it. He said, never forget that always, 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 once upon a time, will trump, thou shalt not. And I thought, what a great quote. And the good news of the gospel of God is that God didn't give us a bunch of
precepts, he didn't give us a bunch of rules, he gave us a relationship with himself. And the more we focus on the relationships that he enables us to have and the relationship he gives us, the more we focus on him. And what we get as a result of him, the more we're going to not only experience a, a, an enriching experience of the gospel in our own lives, the more we're going to live in our culture, the more we're going to live in our families. So that's the good news. Mm -hmm. Not rules, but he put a God to us. So, hey, thanks.